the so called 3 4 5 trillion dollar economy who is it that is according you that status that you are such a x trillion dollar economy it is the foreign agencies it is the imf the world banks the moody's the standards and poors the london stock exchange the zurich stock exchange the frankfurt stock exchange they are the ones who are saying that this is the size of your economy and in the first place what does economy mean are we as a bharatvarsh as a sanatani nation and a culture are we to be defined by the size of our economy is this what we are here for certainly not this is the the sort of uh, subject title that i thought for today which would be our last uh, major session from my reading of whatever i have seen and done with these agencies this seems to be i think one of the goals uh, which uh, is becoming more and more conspicuous from from uh, the actions and the words uh, of the un and multilateral system so if if we say that if we consider this as being perhaps possibly true then the question would arise where did this begin and when and with what and uh, that's why I, we quickly found these images which are guaranteed to give you lasting indigestion uh, of uh, the so called dashboards of these major un ml system programs they started with this these these eight now if you remember this is what i was mentioning to you yesterday so the mdgs millennium development goals uh, so uh, somebody was saying yesterday i don't know whether it, I think so. it could have been some yak i think that you would, have, you would have expected the millennium development goals to finish at the millennium or at the turn of the millennium but that's not the, what they were designed to do they were designed in fact which we didn't know i said certainly didn't know at the time even though i ended up uh, during 2000 and uh, for about 2 years until 2007 when uh, i was uh, a advisory uh, um, sort of resource person to the center for communication and development studies which used to be in pune they since shut down uh, we did a and uh, prevailed upon them to do a study of what is this mdgs why are we spending money on it and uh, what are the mdgs what are the mdgs allegedly doing that we as a country are not anyway doing uh, this was the substance of what i came to study uh, especially in relation to uh, hunger or food and uh, health um so uh, as you can see this although it was called millennium it ran in fact until 2015 even though it was called millennium and the reason it ran is because by around uh, and this i i learnt only later by later i mean in fact much later uh once i uh, started working through unesco on something called cultural indicators which was uh, till then i was uh, with the unesco culture conventions but the cultural indicator had a lot to do with unesco as a whole that means you know you know they have uh, education scientific communications and so on um unesco as a whole plus uh, what is called the un statistical office and this is the one this is one of those un a- a- agencies that is in the shadows somewhat but it is nevertheless very important uh and it's very important that you you immediately understand why when i start to explain it more so they contacted me saying that uh, look you seem to have done some work on uh, uh rural development and so on so you would be from and uh, rural economics so you would be familiar with some of the um ways in which in which um both uh, environment and and uh, such economical structures are measured so i said yes somewhat i'm not an economist nor am i an agronomist 
nor am I a statistician, but I have done work only on the basis of what is the livelihood, what is the household need and so on, because uh, the run-of-the-mill economists seem to kind of neglect that in their construction of models. So to that extent, certainly I can help. Uh, so I was drafted to, together with several others from the Asian region to help construct uh, cultural, so-called cultural indicators for the Asian region countries. Mm, this was, uh, this all happened uh, uh, fairly recently, uh, in fact two years ago. And um, in uh, 2015, uh, what did also happen, which uh, I think has been now kind of got receded into recent history, is that these three big, there were three big conferences uh, which led to the, I think the entrenching of the idea of what is now called Agenda 2030. Uh, how did that take place? That took place because the SDGs were then uh, approved and ratified too by all the 190 plus member countries of the, U of the UN. But to backtrack a bit, so what I am trying to describe to you is a process that began in the mid 90s, which was called Millennium, uh, in order to say that look the, the world should have targets for these eight subjects uh, to be achieved at the turn of the Millennium, they left that uh, relatively undefined what the turn mean it meant that after you pass 2000 uh, and at the outset even I would say until 2005, 6, 7 uh, people like me who in a small way were trying to make sense of this why is the UN stepping in um, when our countries are following a development route however much we may not like that development route but we have some conception of development ourselves and what is this new regime of measurement and indicators that is being brought in? Uh, does it mean that, that the ways in which we have been accustomed to assess our own progress, whatever we call progress, are somehow wrong or lacking or incomplete? So these were the questions that I started to ask uh, administrators whenever I got access to them or whenever I had uh, any connections such as I did during the Ministry of Agriculture period. Uh, of course, at that time nobody knew. Uh, even amongst the administrators, they had, they had not even heard of the UN MDGs. They had really not even heard of the UN MDGs. Although, at the you know at the international intergovernmental level, UN had already started putting out a lot of material, uh, propagandizing the existence of the MDGs as if they had already been absorbed by country administrations and that country administrations attached to these eight sectors were working on them. This was not the case whatsoever. In, in the vital areas of uh, food and health, uh, so far as I could make out, these were unknown. The MDGs were, were unknown by uh, frontline uh, administrators, that means at district level, at municipal level, it says they were unknown. Uh, st state governments, however, by around 2006 or 7, uh, seemed to me to begin to feel some kind of pressure from somewhere to start to talk about MDGs. So that's when I began to notice it in uh, some of the official communiques uh, released by state governments. We are uh, adopting this program in order to be in line with such and such MDG, we are devoting, uh, we are bringing uh, some training to do uh, such and such to fulfill this MDG. Whether any of that happened, I don't know and I seriously doubt, uh, but nevertheless, it, this started to be um, mentioned. If we move ahead to about uh, 2000, the, the period between 2010 and 14, then we will see a marked change in the tone of the UN agencies that had to do with the MDGs. Because while until then they were saying countries are more or less on track or a little bit off track or uh, need a little bit of bucking up to, to get up to speed with what the MDG result or position should be at that year. 
from around 2010 onwards they started uh, saying they adopted a very different tone and that tone was oh we are slipping back the progress is not going as uh, we had planned uh, things are going off track the indicators are shifting from green to red uh, and of course by then they had developed this this um, very sex sexy and seductive system of indicators uh, which began to become which began to be the the calling card of this thing called the mdgs that where in the indicators are we are we moving from left to right which means better or from right to left or up to down whatever it is or from green to red and so on so uh, i mean in one way you know i look at it as the emoticons of the un world the whole thing of indicators the indicators were the meta emoticon that the un employed with great uh, expertise 2010 onwards um if you go by what the un agencies began to say there were very few countries which were on track for their mdg uh success or uh, position that they were supposed to to achieve by that time uh who assigned this position the un agencies themselves in consultation with who at the national level we don't know there are no records that say so uh this is something that i tried to pursue during the period of uh, 2005 to 7 when i undertook this study for this outfit in pune uh where the rec- what what actually is this un agency saying to you as a state administration i was interested in uh, maharashtra at that point as a state administration about these two subjects no record why are you adopting it then uh so clearly there was pressure coming from somewhere so we've crossed 2010 11 12 period by to you know in fact by 2011 12 uh the tone had once again changed in the un system and the associated multilateral agency system to say that look the mdgs uh have served their purpose uh they have at least galvanized countries towards devoting time attention budget resources and the attention of their uh, citizens to these great gaps in their in their uh, progress towards better standards of life and not to forget uh being favorably mentioned by the annual human development report of the UNDP which uh, also has this uh i would say the the grandmother of all indicators which is the hdi the human development indicator amartya sen and uh, his uh, his bangladeshi counterpart yunus yeah yunus yeah, yes the gramin bank gramin bank yes these two gentlemen both from different sides of the river uh decided that uh, they could quantify where at that point 6 billion people's lives were going to go i mean were they completely out of their minds i really wonder what what went on in their heads eh? but anyway whatever it is the un loved it uh and latched onto it uh and converted into into this uh into this uh you know mega driver of everything relating to our lives as citizens under states that had obligations to the system so hdi so we have hdi the mdg indicators the apparent uh, failure of some of countries to to achieve a required level of indicator uh, of uh, indicator position and then by around uh, uh 2000 uh, already by 2012 in fact the un general assembly system itself and the major agencies undp uh, unicef um unesco was on the picture at that stage um ecosoc of course uh and perhaps ilo i'm not sure but they started drumming a different tune altogether what they started saying is that took 
uh, we've done very well on the MDGs for what they were uh, supposed to do to make people and countries aware of their lack in uh, achieving what HDI wants them to achieve. And therefore, we need a new system. Uh, so we have success in, in administering and rolling out the MDGs, but clearly it's not good enough, primarily because the MDGs, Millennium Development Goals, were aimed only at developing and low, uh, low income countries, low and middle income countries, developing countries. They said we need something that will cover the entire world and which will encompass also the emerging problems, the emerging world, the emerging problems of the world systems that we have inherited, which then includes environment, uh, habitat, um, uh, as they called it, biodiversity and so on. So this was much greater in scope, much larger in scope and encompassed not only the developing world as in the former colonial countries and territories but also the former colonizers. 2012 certainly, I'm not entirely sure whether this began in 12 or in 11 but by 2012 uh, the major UN agencies had started uh, farming out um, um, uh, what do they call it? Participatory, um, participatory surveys uh, through their country offices to ask people within the uh, the upper networks of uh, these agencies, what do you think should be included as uh, themes to be the um, the successor to the MDGs? They, they hadn't been called Sustainable Development Goals yet goals yet. Uh, so that went on. Uh, as they discovered that the, the volume of uh, responses was large, uh, then they shifted to a website. That website was run by the, uh, I think it was run by the UNDP only, but I'm not too sure whether the UN uh, um, GA had anything to do with it, may have. It became a very large operation within the space of a year and Tens and tens of thousands of inputs started coming because then they opened it up, having put it up on the website, they opened it up to any and everybody in all the UN languages. Then they, they authorized or they commissioned translations of all that into some other major languages which were not UN languages. So anyway, by, 2000, by the middle of 2012, responses from people all over the world were pouring in as to what the successors of this, uh, the successor of the MDGs should be. All, all of which I think point to one thing undeniably, which is that the reach of the UN propaganda machine is monumental. It goes into every single district in every single country, presumably, uh, because of the kind of responses they got. What they did then was, uh, they, they, as usual in typical fashion, they started appointing, uh, they appointed a high level select committee uh, which was directly under the UNGA and this committee uh, I think started f forming a few broad thematic uh, committees, thematic based still on the MDG approach to begin to segregate what the enormous volume of inputs uh, coming in was. Uh, when they did that, uh, they what do they call them? Uh, working committees, I think yeah, there were several of these working committees, whatever name they gave it. So they started filing these, filtering these into different kinds of baskets. That went on through most of 2012, 2013. In fact, they, they began to uh, shape these into the proto SDGs. Uh, by that time, they had already decided that the DGs part of it needed to remain. What would be the first acronym? Uh, we didn't know, but of course we should have guessed. <laughs> we should have guessed because sustainable is the you know it's like the first word of the gospel now. Let there be light. Let there be sustainability. So they they found sustainable, and of course everybody agreed and and voted on it and said yes, it should be sustainable. Uh, and and 
by I think 2013. Now this is the part that uh, that I am not too clear about because curiously the reason I am not too clear about it is because in the internet record or in the internet archival record what happened during 2012-13 cannot be found easily anymore. The usual places that it was recorded in have disappeared. What did happen however was that uh, the these working groups under the uh, supervision of the UNGA narrowed down the enormous volume of submissions or rather of suggestions from citizens of the world. Remember, it's your planet uh, to about 30 or 35. I can't quite recall because I don't have a reference anymore. It's difficult to find these things. They're about 30 or 35. Uh, which included all sorts of things, including earlier early variations of what we see now as in, uh, as SDGs. So the question is that how did those thirty or thirty five then become these seventeen, which now have been turned into major national programs by all by a number of governments, the majority of governments of the world. This is the part where the record gets really really very fuzzy. Uh, because from what I know, these uh, the, the proto list in fact went to the large, um, uh, of course, the multilateral, uh, multilateral development banks, but also to the business, commercial and industry organizations, uh, many of which had, were already running and funding think tanks of their own and uh, uh, foundations of their own and uh, the from at least whatever uh, information and knowledge I have been I was able to gather during the period of 2010 to about 14 the selection of what has become these 17 is a completely opaque selection process we have no idea how that happened but anyway by 15 this the 17 uh, winning candidates were paraded at the um, one of the major conferences uh, uh, held in that year which were then at the latter part of that year november i think it was of 2015 presented to the general assembly as the 17 sdgs and uh, were approved by all the member states so yeah so this is what this is of course sadly and disappointingly become a common visual currency everywhere uh, in the world in as many languages as is possible to print anything in. By early 2016, the next phase of negotiations about what these SDGs should do and how they should be monitored and uh, turned into trackable commodities was already being discussed. And uh, from there we get these uh, these uh, numbers of the what they call the the targets and the indicators yeah but there, there's some number of target you know the total number of targets and indicators which are quite staggering actually so um, here's what happened next how many targets indicate how many indicators you cannot imagine that this this whole business of of uh, determining or trying to determine how many went on for about a year and a half uh, and uh, mammoth sums of money were spent by statistical agencies and uh, all sorts of uh, other organizations to determine what is the target, what is an indicator, which belongs to which, should it be here, should it be there, is this the right phrasing, phraseology for it, what happens when we translate that phraseology into other languages. Uh, phrases are coming from other languages, should we use it in English and the other UN languages? Uh, should we shift targets around? Do they belong here? Uh, can targets and indicators be shared and so on? This went on for about a year and a half at mammoth cost. These uh, statisticians from the world's major agencies like we have our uh, Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation, MOSPI, MOSPI, they were also a part of it. And in the same way, corresponding uh, agencies and ministries in other countries were also a part of it. They were all roped into doing this, which was 
I, I mean, I'm surprised that Kang didn't throw the book at them. What on earth are you doing this for? Whose is it? Is it yours? But no. Uh, so they would have mam uh, large meetings literally every other month in some uh, exotic capital of the world where, uh, you know, two, three thousand of these people would gather at a time and go on for 10, 12 days at a time just just to, to, to get a list of targets and a list of indicators. Anyway, when finally that was done by 2016, we had this 169 plus heaven knows how many of the other ones. And then began the other machinery, which was to start moving into the major ministries of the governments, uh, the major line ministries, all the ones that you can imagine, uh, including uh, things like uh, where our country is concerned, Ministry of Women and Child Development, which is a very important one for the reasons, for the same reasons that I was talking about the UN Women, Ministry of Rural, uh, Rural Energy and so on in order to get them to start aligning their programs and their budgetary outcomes to what the indicators and targets desire. Uh, this, I think, is, a, is, an, uh, is in fact the, not the genesis, but uh, the biggest signal that our administrations, our ministries, are totally susceptible to outside influence and control. Uh, there is no, you know, there is uh, there is no hidden hand to it. It was overt. It was completely visible, completely bare to, to be seen. Uh, so, from my point of view, I think uh, I approached it very. I approached this problem in very much the same way that I did the problem of the description of a knowledge system. I am being asked to describe what I do, what I know, where I came from and why I am here, not in my terms, not in my language, but in the language that I am told to adopt by a foreign agency, by an outside agency. Here once again, but at a mammoth global planetary scale, I am being asked to describe what I want to do in my limited sphere for my country, not in my terms or in the terms that the, the, the people of my country are accustomed to use, but in the, in the, uh, uh, according to the terms of an outside agency, for which I also have to do the additional task of adopting this whole system of indicators, which I need to understand and I need to spend money to understand. Uh, and the reason why I am presenting this also to you in, in conjunction with uh, what I asked you to remember, what I told you about the knowledge systems, is that I see both as coming from, in fact, both do come from the same organizational mind that I mentioned in the morning. These are products of the same one. And though, although one I presented to you as being culture and this as being sustainable development, they really have the same genesis. So this is what I'd like you to understand. In many ways, we didn't need the UN to do this. Or the UN wasn't needed to do this, but the UN sensed a huge opportunity and being the 800 pound gorilla that it is, it just jumped in. Uh, so why I'm saying this is after, uh, again after World War II, we had this thing called food aid. And all the, the Western countries set up their uh, departments of international development, I mean to give them a sort of generic term. Uh, the most famous and the most uh, emblazoned of which was the U.S. with the U.S. aid. Uh, every single packet, every single box, every single carton, every single sack that had the U.S. aid logo used to have printed as a strap line under that logo from the American people. The American people had no idea there was such a thing as U.S. aid. And this is exactly what it was meant to do. It was meant to shift the surplus of Western food grain, of North American food grain, into our food systems through the this do-gooding, goody-two-shoes uh, mechanism of food aid. You're hungry, you're starving, we're going to feed you the hand of benediction, mm -hmm. the prasadam from the white, with the result that 
Yeah, I mean that, that's really something that I uh, it will take a, uh, you know another hour or two to dis- describe that the effects what that did to our local food economy. The the dumping of of uh, cheap and completely unsuited and uh, uh, food North American and uh, Central European food grain into into our dukans. Uh, I mean, can you imagine making rotis out of that stuff? What that would do, what that would do to us? So you know, there is all that. There's, there used to be a lot of literature on that. I think that has died away <laughs> over the last fifteen to years or so. I don't think people are interested in these fundamental questions anymore. They remain fundamental. They are normalized now. I think yeah, that's a good way to put it. They are normalized now. Kerala was uh, unique in a few ways. Uh, when there were two states which suffered uh, from a particular kind of uniqueness, <laughs> one is Kerala, the other is Goa, uh, by because of uh, of let's say the lack of industry, whether it was by design or by accident or by oversight, um, pushing away its young uh, workforce basically to the Gulf region. Uh, and uh, then when the the um, the returns, I mean, I remember a time when, for example, Goa used to be called the money order economy because it used, a, a lot of households used to survive on the money orders being sent from the Gulf back to uh, Goa. Uh, there was no generation, economic generation in situ, not not you know in place. Uh, um, practically the same thing happened in Kerala and this took on an alarming uh, proportion from the 1970s in both places although the migration from Goa uh, took place much earlier took place much earlier took place much earlier during the declining decades the last three declining decades of the Portuguese op- occupation which ended in uh, 1961 um, but Kerala did not have that excuse uh, Travancore was uh, a flourishing place. So, what did the left, so-called left economics, actually determine for such a state? Um, so, we may say that if Kerala and Goa had this uniqueness and suffered because of it, then what on earth made this particular model, but applied in a different way, become commonplace in other regions of the country? which also exported their young, able-bodied youth, not to the Gulf or anywhere else, but to other cities, with the result then that, you know, we were talking in the morning about a common pool of labor, that common pool of labor disappeared. Uh, then with the, 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 the hammer blow of land reform, land to the tiller and so on, uh, then it became, yes, but even if we have that labor, where would we put it? We don't have those fields anymore. You know, so uh, was this a part of the the wonky socialist thinking? I mean, you could probably blame some of it on that, but uh, you know, I think these have been dealt with in in the academic uh, press for quite a long time. Uh, but again, just like I was saying about the the strangeness of um, the UN occupation. Yesterday I was saying the strangeness of the UN occupation and its effects not making its way into the creative uh, output of a generation. In the same way, this also perhaps hasn't made its way into the creative output of a generation to explain in a better way, non-academic way, which is accessible to people, as to what this great upheaval did. Uh, this swinging between socialist and mixed economy with doses of capitalism, with doses of advice from IMF and World Bank over a period of 20 to 30 years has played complete havoc with our, uh, with our what we call our agri-economy. Where we don't know whether we have land, where we don't know even if we have land, whether we have labor, whether we, when we don't know whether we have both, then we export our own labor somewhere else. Uh, and that all that in fact adds up to a episodic uh, destabilization from which how do you recover there can cannot be any any uh, you, you know any meaningful way how to recover from that 
so you know fr- from the uh, one of the one of the uh, observations that was made on the first day is this in fact a signal or a, a manifestation of evil design looked at solely from the point of view of the outcomes or the consequences i would say it probably is it probably is because if you look at what uh, dharampal had recorded about our thriving agrarian areas uh, and his recording was uh, current as of the last quarter of the 19th century then how could it, the decline have accelerated so much and so fast when till that point we still had i would say uh, the bulk of our rice biodiversity the bulk of our what are called coarse cereal di- uh, bi- biodiversity still in the field still being sown and harvested how could it have uh, declined you know with that acceleration uh, it did and it could because of uh, the the major major element of the so called green revolution um but then again even there uh, that was mostly limited to north india but i mean i have to qualify that as well that was mostly limited to north india because uh, of the rice and wheat concentration of the green revolution technology but what did happen as a result of that concentration of technology the technologists were then exported exported i mean moved away from the green revolution areas of the north indian uh, regions to the rest of india to the newly set up and growing number of icr institutes and centers uh which started proliferating for all many other crops in fact all other crops that we need the legumes the fiber crops the plantation crops the methods of agriculture the dry land wetland semi arid whatever it is river valleys uh so many of them the so that the the technological biases that the green revolution brought in into the scientific community that was then moved out with rapidity uh during the 60s and 70s into the newly set up uh, icr centers so when that happened then uh the package of inhumane practices of the green revolution those became institutionalized in our national agricultural research system and this is in fact what i mean when uh, when i talk about this thing you know the facsimile you know the the country it's administration as a facsimile yeah. this is th- yeah this is very much what i mean by that that what the global system wanted you to do or wanted to see happen in your country it did not happen in your country because it was a good system and your country thought it made sense but because devious agencies were used in order to infiltrate your country and then pervert your own systems wherever they did exist so of course this is my view of it i have a good reason to have this view in 1971 what this congress government did along with the leftists in support they abolished the joint family system and the joint family property which followed the marmakatta and law so what it did was in a sense it said that everybody is is to be treated as uh, the property is partitioned and there are no further joint family property and it can be sold off done anything with so lot of the agricultural chunk of land now became with along with it the land reforms also started then the strikes you know where you have a regimented the workers will tell will work only from 9 itne baje se itne baje 3 ghante kaam karenge when you have a sowing season you have to literally do a lot of work there right and earlier we had a system where the payment was much more than money because you paid money to pay plus kind. grains cash plus kind yeah. yeah was with kind and then you took care of the marriage of the 
uh, of the uh, agricultural laborers who used to work and they used to be more or less a part of the family, extended family, the support system. Like each supported each other, the landlord uh, who's also the farmer and the laborers who work. They both supported each other. So, and whenever there was a problem, because it was a large land holding, whenever there was a famine, the landlord always, although he suffered, he saw to it that the laborers who work for the land are well taken care of. I mean, they always had stock. Now what happens, even those people cannot sustain themselves. How can they give money to uh, the other laborers? And of course, what you said, Mandrega again played a bad role later, you know, taking away the labor completely into Mandrega um, projects. So, uh, agriculture suffering even more, for even further. So, we had a system where uh, actually the Mitakshara and the Mitakshara Dayavaga system there, the north, and the Marmaka time system, which actually protected land and land based economy. I always feel that the joint family system was based on economy that is the land. Mm -hmm. Now this land gets removed. Mm -hmm. There is no economy to sustain joint, joint families. Now it breaks, then you have nuclear families, mm -hmm. then that gets broken even now and now you have vocism. So who gains out of all these things? The Maoist revolution, I mean, uh, all can, and then jihad, and then we have the Christian missionaries again coming from the side and converting. Funnily enough, although the Marmaka time law was abolished, uh, like the Christians who ever bought these lands, they were never affected by the um, abolition of the Marmaka time system. Only the Hindus were affected. So it brought the Hindus to the streets, I mean, impoverished them, and then brought many of them to communism again. And if it happened in a funny circle, you know. People who were landlords earlier became commies, they, they had commies now. So I, this kind of, and, and you now see Kerala the way it is, almost in the threshold of becoming a, a Kashmir, you know. So... That's the problem that I wanted you to come in upon. So it's not just the UN policies as you see, it is literally creating anarchism in your own country so, you know, at the end of it. No, true, that's that's quite right because that's also the reason why I was talking, you know, you, was, you were mentioning about uh, food, uh, food alleviation, which in fact predates uh, the UN just by a bit. But um, if we if we consider this as being UN plus multilateral uh, multilateral uh, uh, agencies, see and 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 I can tell you certainly a couple of other things. I mean, we say green revolution, but who in fact, uh, which were the organizations that brought the green revolution technologists and those packages of practice here? There were two. Rockefeller and the Ford Foundations and you know very well what what the Ford Foundation has been doing over here. The Rockefeller has been somewhat more in the background but no less important. During the time that uh, that I was with the ICAR Ministry of Agriculture program, uh, probably sometime uh, 2009 uh, I began with them but it probably around 2010 or 11 we were trying to construct uh, some kind of framework which would explain uh, why uh, Kisan households were in the desperate condition that so many of them were because we knew that they were what we would call net importers of inflation. So of course, you know, Kisan household does not, uh, does not uh, produce everything that it needs by way of food grain and, and cereal and uh, other items to eat. It produces some which it retains, uh, of which it retains for its own consumption, but not everything. Everything else comes from the market just like everybody else's. And therefore, when the, the what is called the terms of, of agricultural trade are disfavorable to the Kisan, which is practically round the year, 
then the effect of taking on that that inflation inflation assisted price at which they buy all their other goods and commodities which is a city driven inflation not a rural driven inflation but they have to absorb that inflation in exactly the same way this becomes an unbearable burden and this is an, in fact something that has been not studied enough because we only talk about the debt burden of the kisan household relating to the purchase of seed the purchase of uh, inputs and so on we don't talk about the impact of an inflation to which they have not contributed one bit and that is the reason why we we you know for for such a long time we have been looking at ways in which to have to make the village economy or at least the taluka economy self sufficient in especially in food and uh, food items uh, edible oils and so on so that at least this part of the imported inflation gets shut out and and you you're safe there because you know you 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 need to eat every day and you need to buy at least once a week but other items of uh, capital uh, accumulation you will buy once a year maybe once in two years so this is the reason and and this is one of the uh, i think one likely solution which time and time again has been blocked by again by unfriendly policy at the local level but who is it that says that such a policy if it is if it is preferred is unfriendly and why should that autonomy not be there you know th- these are uh, these are aspects which i think especially from the point of view that i have raised as in uh, who pro- who is shunting the un multilateral um ideology into state administrations which is turning their policies their regulations the way that they want the way that the unml want that's why i mentioned about the 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 tremendous drive to turn the every measurement system in every single ministry and administration into alignment with this these uh, hundreds of indicators and targets and all that of the of the un system so that we do not devote enough time to developing our own systems of measurement and assessment and understanding of the of the impacts of any of our regulations and policies we don't you've seen this phrase seat at the high table so for years i've heard this being said uh, in connection with why are we not there at the un security council that is the high table we want to seat at it and i think you know there are really really very simple questions the first of which is whose high table is it it's not it's never ever going to be yours who gives you that seat can you just go and take it no you want to, you've been asking for it you're asking for it it's not the, yours for the taking you have to ask and permission has to be given to you to take it so the seat is not yours either so in the same way the so called 3 4 5 trillion dollar economy who is it that is according you that status that you are such a x trillion dollar economy it is the foreign agencies it is the imf the world banks the moody's the standards and poors the london stock exchange the zurich stock exchange the frankfurt stock exchange they are the ones who are saying that this is the size of your economy and in the first place what does economy mean are we as a bharatvarsh as a sanatani nation and a culture are we to be defined by the size of our economy is this what we are here for certainly not if you look at the lgbtq community of india mm-hmm. it has been very successful in being very indian the mm-hmm. lgbtq mm-hmm. Uh, especially the transgender community mm-hmm. within it and then this government comes out with the transgender protection bill in 2018 it is protested against they make an advisory committee don't take their advice <laughs> and pass it just as it was in 2019 so this it's a very small uh, you know a number of people just from i think 4 to 8 lakh transgenders in this country but even then you know uh, they have uh, there there is this entire culture that uh, they carry single handedly mm-hmm. the transgender culture mm-hmm. that india has and so when you don't give give them the kind of uh, visibility that they need 
and use them as as a way to further your agenda as uh, you know that we are completing whatever we promised in the manifesto then it just becomes hard for okay. uh, making the country as a unit which is what is required to fight against um, organizations you know, okay, that try to conflict you say that, uh, you say that they have retained the indian tradition and culture like could you explain that a bit like how yes so i mean if you uh, there are uh, people who identify as gay or lesbians in uh, colleges and universities i am keeping them aside for a little while uh, but if you talk about people like gopi shankar mm-hmm. uh, if you talk about people like to some extent lakshmi narayan and tripathi yeah. to some extent or um and then if you talk about gauri savant again to an extent um they have not just been the pioneers of the transgender community but the lgbt community at large uh, the the other parts of the lgbt community in india have not uh, wanted to step into the intellectual space as much as they should um but there is very much this this um, again this instinct that they want to connect with the indian side of this because it's very much there mm-hmm. this history is very much there so um, you are only giving them grounds to become more westernized uh, and and if that culture of lgbtq comes to us then it's just going to bring you know just catalyze this entire uh, society getting into ruins even faster see so that's we had a very different approach for lgbt whatever it is mm-hmm. so we have always had this system where we never unlike the abrahamists beat christians or muslims we never uh, like the christians arrested them you have oscar wilde being uh, arrested uh, right and then the muslims killing them uh, right uh, we during stoning them yeah to death. stoning them to death and whatever yeah. so we never had those systems yeah. we at the same time we accepted accepted in the sense of recognized fine, it recognized that it is there it is there it is mm-hmm. there mm-hmm. but we do not say that we uh, we uh, what do you call promote it mm-hmm. we don't promote lgbtq or whatever right because it's not as though see there is a problem to it for that matter we don't promote anything <laughs> yeah but, uh, yeah this yeah, thing is about everybody yeah. it is it, see there is no stress just on sex because this lgbtq business is total i mean stress on sex although although we had never been averse to it in the sense you mean in the west yeah in, uh, yeah. in the west yeah. it is completely nothing but yeah. A stress on sex. That's all. I mean myself, my sex. I mean all kinds of. You find all kinds of weird things these days. There's something I want to read out to you while you gaze at this uh, multiple images. Using children to promote UN projects has by now become standard operational procedure. It has the double advantage of appealing. to the parental and protective instincts of adults while at the same time it has a profound influence on the attitudes of the children themselves who participate this is all there in, in your class also for instance in 1960 unicef distributed a promotional folder designed for children entitled how children help children through unicef through unicef they incapable of helping each other just by themselves The back page illustrated with crude drawings of a cow, a truck and a child read Many children in Italy call a cow UNICEF because they never tasted milk before UNICEF came. Many children in Brazil think the American word for truck is UNICEF and in the hills near Galilee one little boy said my father says in heaven there is god here there is UNICEF This is the kind of calculated tug on the heartstrings that loosens the purse strings. Tattered and starving children peer at us from billboards. Baseball stars and movie celebrities urge us over radio and TV to give generously, and professional organizers appear in each community to excite an uncritical emotion of compassion. community leaders are maneuvered into endorsing a project project they do not understand and an organization whose budget they are never permitted to see ditto and then ordinary housewives enthusiastic because they are sincere 
march from home to home ringing doorbells. But if the person who is being solicited questions the noble cause in any way, those volunteers are apt to be miffed and feel insulted. After all, they know that their own motives are beyond reproach and since they have already indentured themselves emotionally with the cause, they cannot help but react with horror when they find someone so cruel and selfish as to ask questions when tiny children are starving. The examples are endless. In 1951, the US National Citizens Committee of UN Day distributed over 30,000 copies of entitled A Useful Teacher's Guide Planning for United Nations Day. This was 1951. And over 1.3 other pieces of literature were mailed out. Over 30, 50,000 kits containing materials and instructions to make hand-sewn UN flags were distributed and over half a million women and girls across the nation participated in the project. United Nations propaganda is even in the comic books. For instance, the inside cover of a recent issue of Superman contains an illustrated tale of how the UN World Health Organization came to the rescue and saved a small Burmese village from the bubonic plague. At the end of the story, we find this is your United Nations at work. When you celebrate UN Day on October 24th, be proud your country is a member nation. Through the UN, our nation is working with other nations for better health and happiness for people the world over. You have to applaud all this. I mean, you really have to. For 70 years, these people have been propagandizing with the greatest expertise, the greatest sophistication, and they have fooled thousands and thousands of administrators year after year. How has it been done? Just look at this. Not long after, this face was accompanied by another face, screaming and howling, having a tantrum. In this case, she went, she, she went completely theatrical on the world stage. So, how does this happen? What do you think? Moreover, sir, uh, you know how people applauded the fact that she's left school for the climate change? Doesn't this show the privilege, the white privilege that she <clears throat> has? We don't even have the privilege of having all our children go to school. And she's leaving school to talk about an issue she has done nothing about. She's just come out with a book. Isn't that wastage of paper that she's against? The yeah. stories about the exposés are legion, you know. Mm. Uh, but, you know, the thing is, I want you to think about how does this all happen in such a sophisticated way and achieve the success it does? Because I, I abhor the success that it achieves, but it's there. If you have observed, their role models are always like the people they project. They are either women they're, or they are victims or they are children. So that you can't uh, completely go against them. And if you go, in the replies and all, you'll find this woke people, you know, bashing you. Can, how can you be, uh, you know, so rude to a child? Or how can you be this? So they are, they are playing it very smartly. So, you know, this is your point about either women or children. Yeah. Remember what I said about UN women, that UN yes. uh, agency, UN agency for women. So what we're seeing, certainly what uh, I have been seeing, uh, on the sidelines of all this uh, work with uh, UNESCO, etc., etc., is that this is, I think this is extremely, this is certainly visible, it's not invisible, it's, it's, it's visible, it's upfront, it can be seen, it can be deduced, you, one uh, is able to understand the implications. That there are UN agencies and uh, I would have to say UNICEF is uh, at the forefront whose stated agenda hides another agenda uh, amongst other hidden agendas and this particular hidden agenda is in fact relating I think a, in a way to what was being discussed before the tea break which completely foxed my brain which has to do with the attack, the concerted attack on the family unit and household split them apart, split apart parents from each other by uh, in the first place saying that women are the vulnerable gender, man is the oppressive gender. Uh, having split them apart, then invent 
several other genders to fill in the gap uh, and while doing that remove the child from the household the protection of the household the protection of uh, the extra household that is a, any larger uh, household unit which would be a joint family if it still exists elders or anybody else and turn the child into an autonomous unit uh, to be controlled by the agents of one of the un agencies using its uh, tactics and 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 uh, methods and uh, i would say that this is i would say that this is the inescapable conclusion i have certainly come to i i don't think i can be convinced otherwise why is this why do why do i think this way because the emergence of the earlier phase and then this phase and then soon after uh, greta became became a world youth icon i started seeing to my complete uh, surprise uh, i think about probably by 19 or 20 2019 or 20 there was a girl from whose name i can't recall from one of the northeastern states probably meghalaya so what did happen uh, is that in all the countries in which the greta iconography made an impact some kind of measurable measurable impact and this measurable the impact was being measured by agencies whom we don't know uh and transported back to UNFCCC uh they started looking for youth ambassadors in states but not in every state and not in every kind of state in states where it would make a political difference that means in states of that country where it would make a lispria kanujam lispria lispria yeah yeah, lispria. yeah correct manipur is she manipur is she manipur now everyone knows that the northeastern states are politically and socially sensitive regions so this is what i am po- trying to point out to you and this has happened in a number of other countries uh, in a number of other countries by 2022 there were the equivalent of this lispria whatever her name is uh, who were all became in the cohort of global followers of greta who were also getting attention by themselves what does this tell you this told me that the un agencies are so venal that they will continue to use the same tactics and same methods for which they were about which they were already exposed half a century and more ago but because these tactics and methods have been so effective and continue to continue to be they will continue to use them so we are dealing with a system that is in its treatment of people is been shown to be monstrous and yet our administrations are falling over each other to work with them so this is what i'm saying is is our Made, I mean, this is the problem that we face, and um, I think tomorrow, if we can spend some time, you know, just brainstorming about what 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 are the the ways in which we can tackle this at whatever level is possible, then at least some outcome or some uh, result of uh, our uh, getting together for these three days will will come to some fruition. You see, because any way you look at it, this is—I think this is this is terribly monstrous, and uh, some of it I have had to deal with directly. Uh, once again, relating to Cambodia, I think I might mention this to you when I had to juggle the demands of uh, UNICEF, the the most powerful uh, UNESCO, and the Ministry of Education in Cambodia, where UNICEF is in fact. directing at the primary school level and everything else thereafter everything that teachers will be trained in will introduce into their curriculum and syllabi and how they will report so when you i mean in a country like uh, cambodia of uh, 25 26 million odd people when you completely give over on a sector like education into the hands of an agency 
uh, so-called world agency, what on earth are you left with? You are left with a doomed generation. Now, Cambodia may be 27 million people and we may, we may think that we have, we have, you know, 850 odd million adults uh, in our country and uh, we can certainly deal with that kind of threat. But how many of our, of our state's populations correspond to Cambodia's is the question I want to ask you. How many do you think? All the northeastern states. All the northeastern states. Kerala, Easily. right? These two are very much... Various other area. regions, yeah. Various other regions. How have they already been uh, infiltrated? I'll tell you one way in which I found out, and this was quite a long time ago, during the time that I was working with the uh, Ministry of Agriculture uh, project. At that time, when we started talking about the, you know, what I was mentioning earlier about the impact of uh, urban origin inflation on farmer households and the need to find ways uh, in each agroclimatic and agroecological zone to be able to deal with it. You cannot have a national uh, way to deal with it, nor can you have a state way to deal with it. The only way to deal with it is that I would have actually preferred river basins, but that became too complex for them to deal with. Uh, that's when we started finding out that the people to whom the administrators were referring these questions and demands that our project was raising were not, were not other administrators at all. They were the uh, KPMGs, Ernst & Young's, mm. Deloitte's, Accenture's and those, those outfits. You know who those outfits are. Yeah. They are the big global consulting agencies. They are the ones uh, and this was already as far back as probably around 2011. So they were the ones who were already there. So I, we, I encountered them, I understood that they were there in 2011 or so, which is 20, uh, 12 years ago. But they were already there and had maneuvered themselves into the position where they were the fallback go-to people for the state administration in a matter as sensitive and as important as agriculture. It happened to be the same in rural development, it happened to be the same in health, and it happened to be the same in industrialization, urban, etc, etc, etc. No, but that's a good assessment because, in fact, uh, what I have, the other, I mean, one of the conclusions I've come to is that the, uh, the large global consulting firms are, in fact, very, uh, very important members of the whole multilateral establishment. Coming back to this, this emergence of, uh, you know, why is this, uh, who is monitoring how the uh, res the reception to the youth icons was spreading in society? I think it's very likely that some, uh, perhaps some media organizations or agencies who are skilled in, in being able to understand this were in fact uh, commissioned by one of these uh, consulting firms, especially in areas which are politically sensitive, which are uh, uh, have larger minority populations and so on. Uh, so that is one possibility, but that again is something that uh, I think bears further investigation from a media which no longer exists today, unfortunately. More, more, uh, far more worryingly, I think what what this uh, what this points out is that our state administration, our state administrative uh, capacity, has already been transferred to foreign powers. Uh, those foreign powers uh, may be foreign nation states uh, plus the UN or UN agencies acting in concert with large uh, uh, OECD countries. This is something we don't know which is still, you know, behind the scenes because uh, no amount of inquiry, direct inquiry will elicit any kind of reasonable answer. I've tried and it's got nowhere. I've asked about, for example, when we first saw this in, this was in Bihar, by the way, uh, that uh, we first ran into this in 2011. Um, and uh, at that time, interestingly enough, but not surprising, uh, Bihar was the state in which the Gates Foundation had put in the most money at that time and probably still is one of those states. So I think at, at this point in our three days, what I hope I've tried to, to I've been able to do is uh, present you different threads of 
this UN plus ML story that I came here to give you and perhaps it's come together in some kind of uh, loom but now we have to make the machinery to do something with it. But it's distributed through, you know, the usual Reuters, AP, AFP, DPA. And they're very much aligned with what the UN has to do. Completely, yeah, completely. I mean, who are the chaps who are on the ground whenever there's... Uh, with a uh, you know with that cameras and their yeah, telephoto right. lens, uh, any time there's an impending conflict, it's these guys. Mm. Who takes them there? The World Food Program. That is a strategy, but it's, I don't know whether that's the strategy that applies to us. Mm. Uh, one reason that I could tell you why I think it doesn't is because China is run by the CCP, and uh, the CCP runs a godless country. Yes. We are not a godless country. So our reasons have to be very different from what Chinese reasons are. Collaboration with the UN is, uh, well, it's you dangerous, know, it's sure. certainly dangerous. At the same time, non-collaboration is also dangerous. Yes. So if both collaboration and non-collaboration are dangerous, mm. then what should we do? So I think what could be a tactic? And there has to be a tactic and I'm positive that there is. Uh, but that's something we have to put our minds to. And it's really not as far-fetched as it sounds, huh? because I'm quite convinced that today in India, there are very few people who are thinking along these lines, uh, along these lines, that we're damned if we do and we're damned if we don't. But we need to do something. There's one thing which, you know, any such effort has to really, really take notice of and study very, very carefully, which I don't think are... Uh, uh, what are they called? Uh, geostrategic, uh, what geostrategic uh, experts are, are doing. They're doing it a lot with relation to USA, geopolitical geostrategic. And they're doing it a lot with relation to USA and in relation to, to China. But I don't see anybody doing it in relation to the UN. I haven't come across anybody. I, I know I'm part of that Adityan's uh, group, yeah, that strategic, uh, whatever you call it, yeah, Adityanji. Uh, all these chaps are there, these ex-bureaucrats, ex-diplomats, yeah. But Vijay Sazawal and uh, Rebba Pragada and all sorts of other people who keep writing columns here there and everywhere in, in Indian and global media. But not once have I seen and I've asked Adityan about this, look, you chaps are going on talking about USA and China, where's the UN for God's sake? Nothing. Uh, but there's one thing which I'd like to draw your attention to with relation to any tactic that, uh, any strategy which is possible or may be possible for India vis-a-vis -vis the UN. And I, I'm going to read this out. This is a quote. The treaty making power, the treaty making power is an extraordinary power li liable to abuse. Treaties make international law and they also make domestic law. They also make domestic law. Under our constitution, in this case it happens to be the US constitution, treaties become the supreme law of the land. They are indeed more supreme than ordinary laws, for congressional laws are invalid if they do not conform to, that, to the constitution, whereas treaty laws can override the constitution. Treaties, for example, can take powers away from the congress and give them to the federal government or to some international body and they can cut across the rights given the people by the Constitutional Bill of Rights. This was written in 1952 by John Foster Dulles, the then Secretary of State of the USA. Rahul ji, in this, as far as our Constitution is concerned, the treaty has to be ratified by our Parliament. Only then it can be, uh, can, it, can we uh, have it implemented in our municipal laws or we, as we call it the state law. Municipal is generally used in international law as the state law, right? So, uh, till that is done. Gayatri, I think I know where you are leading, but I tell you something. Through the agency of these consulting companies, these global uh, consulting firms, those treaties are already coming in as public-private partnerships. The text, the meaning, the intent of those are already coming in, they have already come in. And that is where you got this whole thing of smart cities from. Where is the legislation connected to smart cities? We haven't seen any. 
the threat again now with WHO and the uh, international health regulations, which will which is uh, liable if passed to give the WHO uh, overriding powers over our uh, health sector. So you know the, the I mean this this kind of dangers already within our doorstep uh, within the door. It's not not at the doorstep any longer. Can we have this strategy? For example, now we had this workshop. We need to have more such workshops. We need to start speaking about it more, writing about it more, so that it starts gaining a currency just like how now it is being recognized that our history books, textbooks have to be rewritten. At least there's an acknowledgement. Okay, it's not happening, but at least there's an acknowledgement that there's a problem. So till we have to speak so much and write so much about it, till that stage is reached and then we need to even uh, say, um, invite some um, bureaucrats in such conferences as these, perhaps on a Sunday, Saturday, Sunday weekend, invite one of them, some IS officer who's, uh, who's open to um, sort of receive right invite them in such seminars such workshops so that we start putting it in their heads to consider what they are up to so that way we can start influencing our own bureaucracy now sensitize them to the problem make them aware of what is the problem at hand open their minds not think that the un is all great benefactor so can that be an approach this is where uh, this is where there's there's some sort of gap which we we seem to be unable to cross that uh, what is making it um, imperative for you to follow what an agency an outside agency tells you when uh, we have abundant uh, ability at home uh, you know for example my asking for that that contract between WHO and IOSH why or not do you have this contract? What what pushes you to do it? This whole thing about we are part of this post-Westphalian world. I mean, what on earth does post-Westphalian mean to a Sanatani? I am sovereign according to who I worship to. I have I follow Dharma in whatever way I understand it. I belong to a Punya Bhumi. In you looking at it from that point of view, that is the reason I say the cul- civil, uh, culturally civilizationally rooted public policy. That is the reason it is imperative. Why come from the, that point? The gap that I see is why are these bureaucrats who I think would see th- things in at least some part of their life or some part of their existence in the way that I just described. Mm-hmm. Why do they feel it imperative to cling on to the bits and pieces of this international order? The actual story is that yeah, when, yeah. when in 19, so when we got independent, we imported the entire British administration system. Mm. Straight away. Mm. That's mm. Sardar Patel. Well, we gave her a new coat of paint, that's all we yeah. did. Yeah. Yeah. IC is Internally, they are still with that mindset. For that matter, even the police system in India is also running by archaic British laws and it functions in the same way with the British, the state was to suppress any revolution or rebellion and that's how they're supposed to treat the citizens. For that matter, that mindset and mentality still continues, even though they are Browns now, like as you say, Indians in it. But it's still an Anglo it's a police or a, state, it's a British administration. The same goes for army. The, the army also to a certain extent yes. and the same applies to the administration also. Their way of functioning is still the same. They might have got, so everything that comes is out from outside. There's no internal churning that is happening within them and they don't know how to do it is the main thing. They might be generalists and specialists and everything, but at the end of the day, their whole goal to be injected into that system through a UBSC examination is also very British in its very thing. The syllabus is designed. The syllabus is designed like that. The whole mindset, like if you ask an administrator that do you know for what you have gone in there? They will just rattle off the syllabus that they have there. And all those people who are training them also in the Indian Institute of Public Administration for that matter, yes, they have same. refresher courses and everything. The trainings are also coming from British 
and European theories and way right. of functioning and importing. There's no comparative you studies. Would rather go to Nolan laws. No, no, yeah, don't go to. So it's coming a yeah. compare. So the whole system is such that you are constantly in an environment that is not feeding the culture and the thing into your brain and how to function. It's very mechanical. Now, Still, a uh, a bureaucrat is like a babe in the woods. You know, like a deer with the flashlights on. It's still like that in the bureaucracy. And I think as Gayatri said, it's very right. They want to do something, the new generation especially, that they want to, the steel frame and iron cage of this bureaucracy, which is caught up in this Weber, Weberian, you know, idea bureaucracy. They still follow that. Written rules and all those those 10 principles. So the theories, even I teach Baba are about European theories. There's nothing Indian about it. So the students I'm teaching to are also learning that. So there's no culture ingrained in them, they're cut off. And then they enter to the services, which is a service, which is as it is. And Patel very proudly said that we have not changed anything. It is the administration that the British had and it's the best. And we are taking that as it is. Mm. So till now there has been no, because the bureaucracy exerts a lot of force on the politicians. Because they are the ones who feed into the policy and the laws. So the politicians want to keep them happy. The bureaucrats want to rent seeking, as they say, bureaucrats. That is their mentality and so we're moving to new public management and new public administration and all those big terms that are also coming from the West. Yes. Syracuse University and Minobro conferences and all everything. Yeah. Which, uh, so this Fred Riggsian ecological perspective of administration also applied to me China and Japan. Yeah, yeah. He never came here and he never understood India and that too Agora is telling ecological mm. perspective. So now where do you go, where does the bureaucrat move unless there is a churning within him to do something different in this system which is already set and it's a burgeoning huge system that you can't even think of. Like I have bureaucrats books who talk about uh, self-seeking, you know, they have seeked out on their own. Uh, and so you have these bits and pieces and that's what we are trying to should target to get them here and then say, okay, what you're thinking is right, but we'll show you the way. Like how to not be that babe in the woods or anything, you know. So they want to change, but then they also have to be in tune. And this government is especially very much concerned about these conventions and treaties and everything. And the world forum, very much concerned about that. The political will matters the most. Like if a politician says that today the bureaucracy is going to be changed like that, he'll face, um, what you say, backhanded or passive aggressive backlash from the bureaucracy. Uh, but he has to have the will and the gut to stand up to that yes. and change them. So it's a system versus system happening here. And uh, so it's all lethargy. It's all uh, all Endurance. that kind of yeah. thing. But then how do you go about it is to pick out those ones who want to uh, do something different and then get them to, like you can show them the way. I don't know, I mean you are out there, why they are not even you know reaching out. To show them the way and then they would infiltrate into because the system back. Yeah, they were they oppose were change. That's mm -hmm. that's exactly. So they'll go back into the system with this in their mind, and they want to change, and so then they'll try to experiment something probably. That's what happens, you know, when the, these cases like Shabri Mala come up. You don't have a sense of identification with the society. You don't understand the sentiments of those people associated, and that's how you come from some Oxford and Cambridge, and then you try to impose those principles over this that okay, no, we want equality, and that's why we want women to enter. So it doesn't function this way. State won't take it up because uh, the very form of the state has changed. So the state as we were apt to recognize it itself is no longer recognizable because it administrative power and administrative practice has been ceded now. I feel now this present, present government, Narendra Modi's style of working is anyway bureaucracy heavy. Bureaucracies are not a program to think much. They are just that this is the pranali, this process is. Yeah, so follow, follow karna, how can you do it better? Like how can you be a better machine? But you know, Tanya, this is precisely what I am trying to point out is the danger. Because if all we have is bureaucrats following a process, rather than examining the process that they have been asked to follow and say, look, uh, based on, I am a citizen of this India, I am a bureaucrat second. Uh, and therefore, as a citizen, I have you know, let us call it some element of spirituality and a dharmic compulsion. Uh, whereas this process that I have been given uh, to follow 
doesn't seem to exhibit any of that. Uh, so, which are the parts that I can remove uh, and which are the parts that I can replace? Why doesn't the bureaucracy, isn't the bureaucracy able to do that? Are you, I, I mean, are we saying that a process has forever to be an, an import from outside because this is what it is? What I told you about the land systems of British India by Baden Powell, that has persisted until this day. Till this day, we have this completely absurd uh, categorization of one land form called wasteland, mm -hmm. which was invented by Baden Powell. It was uh, he, it, it, there was never any such thing as wasteland before it, uh, and uh, and so the. What I see as this, you know, as what I was describing yesterday as this tier 1 of the UN, tier 2 of the other multilaterals, tier 3 of all their associated organizations, they are adept at inventing processes. And they are adept also at inventing the legislative machinery uh, and the proto-legislative machinery which will tie nations and their provinces to these processes. Once the, the, the country accepts that, then the bureaucrats have no incentive to replace or revise. This is something that, needs, that they need to understand there.